Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. said in the last lecture, today we are going to talk about certain basic facts about convex optimization itself. That is, we are going to discuss today the minimization of a convex function f subject to x belonging to a convex set c. So, this is what I called a convex function and this is what I call a convex set. Now, of course, the question is what is a convex function and what is a convex set. Now, before I uh, start the full fledged discussion, let me tell you that uh, I would like to uh, show you a book which uh, you I think everybody should have a look at it. This book is called Optimization Insights and Application written by Jan Brinkwis and Vladimir Tikhomirov and I have spoken about a book called Stories about Maxima and Minima uh, written by Vladimir Tikhomirov. This book is a fabulous book whether you want to do convex optimization or even the non-convex one has a huge amount of insight. It is published by Princeton University Press in the Princeton series in applied mathematics, uh, quite a recent publication and it is just a mind blowing read and in, in fact it is something everybody who wants to do anything with optimization should have a copy in their desk. So, going back we will first define what is a convex set. Simply put convex set means that if I take a set in general in R n but as always we will look in look into the pictures in R2 and take two points x and y in this set any two points and join them by a line segment. Then this line segment should also remain inside the set. Now if you look at this set whatever points you take and when you whenever you join them they remain inside this set. You take a set like this. I take a point here, I take a point here and I try to join join it, it goes outside or a set like this, it is more clear. If I take these two points, I join them, a part of the line segment is outside the set. So, this set is convex, these two are non-convex. If you look at your own body, your human body, the human body is non-convex because if you take a point here, I take a point here, you join them, it is completely outside the body. So, human body is a non-convex thing, is a non-convex set. Now, how do I formalize this definition that if I join any pair of points by a line segment, the line segment has to be in the set and that is that, that sort of set is called a convex set. So, to begin with I will talk about the def given any two points x and y in R n, the definition of a line segment. The line segment is usually denoted as with this symbol, it is a set of all z which is expressed as lambda times y into 1 minus lambda times x, where lambda is a number between 0 and 1. So, it means if I take this two points x and y and if I put lambda equal to 0 here, I am getting x and if I put lambda equal to 1, I am getting y. So, as I vary lambda from 0 to 1, we move along this line from x to y. So, it is clear that this is nothing but the simple geometric line segment that we know. So, even when you are talking about two points in three dimensional space, we are talking about this line segment. 
Now, formally a convex set is a set such that for any x y in the set x y line segment is also a subset of the set. So, this is just a thing in the English language which you now understand very well. Now, what is a convex function? A convex function can be defined from R n to R. or it can be defined from a set convex subset C to R, where C is a subset of R n and is convex. Now, the most original or the most or rather I would say the earliest definition of a convex function was due to Jensen, W B V Jensen. And Jensen gave this definition which says that if you consider R from R n to R or even from C to R. So, f of lambda y plus 1 minus lambda x See, this is very well defined. If you take a convex set C and y and x two elements of C, then lambda y plus 1 minus lambda x, whenever lambda is between 0 and 1 is element of C. So, this functional operation is well defined. This has to be less than lambda times f y plus 1 minus lambda times f x for all x y in R n or C and lambda in 0 1. This is the definition of Jensen, but a much more modern definition can be given in terms of epigraph. Epigraph of a function f is everything that lies above the graph. So, if this is a function f and this is the graph an epigraph is the dotted portion along with the outer curve. Anything above the graph is called the epigraph. So, this is the epif, epigraph of f. Okay. So, the epigraph of f which we denote as epif is the collection of all elements x alpha, where x is in R n and alpha is in R such that f of x must be less than or equal to alpha, which is very clear from the diagram. Now, what you can prove is that a function is convex if and only if its epigraph is convex. Now, proving this is a simple fact because you look at this function whose epigraph is convex, then you can prove that this definition satisfies the definition that we had given on page this page. So, going ahead let me try to prove that if f is convex then epigraph of f is convex. So, let us assume that f is convex. Now, you consider two elements x 1 alpha 1 and x 2 alpha 2 from the epigraph of f both of them. Now, if you make a combination lambda x 1 
alpha 1 plus 1 minus lambda x 2 alpha 2, where lambda is some number between 0 and 1. Then this just means lambda x 1 plus 1 minus lambda of x 2 comma lambda times alpha 1 plus 1 minus lambda times alpha 2. So, I have said that epigraph of f is convex, right. Now, since f is convex, I have to prove that the epigraph of f is convex. Now, convexity of f tells me that lambda x 1 plus 1 minus lambda x 2 is less than lambda f of x 1 plus 1 minus lambda f of x 2. You must remember one thing, if your lambda is attached here, your f x 1 lambda gets attached to f x 1. If 1 minus lambda is with x 2, 1 minus lambda on this side gets attached to f x 2. But since x 1 alpha 1 is in the epigraph, f of x 1 is less than alpha 1. And since x 2 and alpha 2 is in the epigraph, f x 2 is less than alpha 2. So, which means that f of this would imply that f of lambda x 1 plus 1 minus lambda x 2 is less than equal to lambda alpha 1 plus 1 minus lambda alpha 2. By the very definition of the epigraph, go back once again, check the definition, look at this definition, f x is less than equal to alpha, all such x alphas for which this occurs. So, this is an x and this is an alpha, this is an r n and this is an r and then this would imply that lambda x 1 plus 1 minus lambda x 2, lambda alpha 1 plus 1 minus lambda alpha 2, this is in the epigraph. So, I have taken two arbitrary elements in the from the epigraph and showed that their convex combination lies in the epigraph, which proves that a p f is convex or is a convex set to be more precise. Now, suppose I go want to go back, I want to go back and prove that given a p f is convex, then f is convex. Now, by the definition of epigraph, if you take two points x 1, then x 1 x 1 and x 2, then x 1 f x 1 and x 2 f x 2, both these points are in the epigraph, they belong to the epigraph of f, both of these two points are in the epigraph. And you know that epigraph f is given to be convex. So, which means that for all lambda you take between 0 and 1, for all lambda between 0 and 1, lambda x 1 plus 1 minus lambda x 2, lambda f x 1 plus 1 minus lambda f x 2 is in the a p f. Again by the definition of a p f, it simply means that f of lambda x 1 plus 1 minus lambda x 2 is less than lambda times f x 1 plus 1 minus lambda times f x 2. So, in many cases the modern definition of convex functions are given in this way that a function is a convex function if the epigraph is a convex set. So, here okay, here we go back to the usual definition of a convex function, I will just rub this to make it all right. Now, now let me tell you about a text from which you would be able to know convexity or convex analysis at its best. So, I will refer to the most legendary and classical text in this area called convex analysis. This is published by Princeton, it was published by Princeton University Press in 1970 and it is republished in 1994 as Princeton Landmarks in Mathematics and this is by one of the famous mathematicians in this area, Ralph Tyrell Rockefeller, 
whose name is almost synonymous with convex analysis. So, anybody who is an optimization student, who is a graduate student in optimization should have this book with him. And, and our own experience as a researcher, as a, my own experience as a researcher in optimization that even if I am stuck with some difficulty in convex analysis in my research, I just have to go to the book of Rockefeller, hang around with it for a few hours and the answer would, I mean you, we can actually figure out, you can actually figure out the answer. So, that is the power of this book. Now, let me tell you one thing uh, is that this book is not a book which has to be read from cover to cover. No mathematics books are actually, uh, they are not story books that you read from cover to cover. Uh, you, you can follow if you read uh, the places where you want, but this book specifically is not a cover to cover book as written by the author himself in the preface that you really need to, this book is something which is to help you when you are in trouble. But this book is a must for all optimization researchers and graduate students in optimization. I would write here strongly recommend it. Now, if you look into this book, I will just digress a bit. I understand that here I have a diverse audience as I realized uh, rather I had said in the last lecture because of this diverse audience, I would like to reduce a bit the rigor that is required to do the mathematics of this subject. But however, to give the taste of what convex analysis is and our convexity is, we need to go and understand the idea of an extended value function. If you go and open this book convex analysis, in the very first uh, chapters dealing with convex functions, you will see that he, Rockefeller speaks about convex functions which are defined from R n to R bar, where R bar is R union the two infinities minus infinity and plus infinity. It looks strange, but this is called the extended real line. Now, why you need to speak about extended real line? The reason is essentially as follows, you will realize as we go on that the unconstrained problems where there are no restrictions on the decision variables, such problems are much more easy to tackle than the problems which have restrictions on the decision variable like we saw last uh, in the last lecture. So, how do I theoretically convert a problem which is a problem with restrictions on the variable to a problem which does not have restrictions in the variable. To do this, if you look at the problem that we are dealing with minimize f x, x element of c, then this is a constraint problem. This has a restriction that x, x is pressed to c. Then consider this, consider this function. which takes the value f x when x is in c and takes the value plus infinity when x is not in c. Though you might uh, find it be difficult in the beginning to appreciate this, but those who know some optimization has read a have a very have an exposure to undergraduate nonlinear optimization, they would realize possibly that this is what is called a penalization that if you violate the constraint I impose infinite penalty on you theoretically. And this, this is nothing but a theoretical model of the penalty function method which is quite a common method in solving uh, constraint optimization problems. So, this f naught if f is convex then this f naught is an extended convex function. But when you define extended convex functions, you have to have certain rules on infinity and minus infinity. So, we will not get into all this at this moment, we will come into the rules as and when required. So, when we will study convex functions and convex sets in details, which we will start from tomorrow, we will go into the 
a bit of this issue. So, that even if you get, get into this books like convex analysis or further books that I will say, you will be comfortable enough to handle these things. So, now let me get back straight into the modeling of this problem. Now, this problem which we will start referring to as C p, where f is a convex function and c is a convex set is called an abstract version of a convex optimization problem, because though f has a representation c does not have a representation. Sorry, this is a convex function and this is a convex set. Now, let me tell you a very simple thing is that the set C in most applications is represented as a set of all inequalities usually. Where all these GIs are themselves convex functions. You might ask me, okay, what about this is the standard thing, what about equalities? Equality constraints are quite well known to you, possibly in calculus when you learn Lagrange multiplier rule, uh, you will talk about equality constraints. So, where is your equality constraints? Okay, let me talk about a set C. So, I talk about this set C hat and that I talk about in R2, so that you visualize it, x y in R2 such that x square plus y square minus 1 is equal to 0. So, if you look at this, this is a convex function and then if you try to sketch this set, this set is nothing but this one, only the circle, nothing inside, only the circular ring, but then if you take a point here and take a point here and join it, except these two points, the whole line is outside the circular ring. So, this is not a convex one. So, if you put convex equalities here, you are not going to get in general a convex set. So, what happens? What sort of equalities uh, you need to put in? The equality constraints that need to be put in to have a convex set at the end has to be of a particular form they are of this particular form, they are called affine function. So, they are usually written in this form for a fixed given A. So, this is in R n and this is in R. So, a linear function plus a translation. So, this is a translation of a linear function. So, basically a linear function you see this is a linear function y equal to x, any linear function has to pass to 0 in R 2 and then you just translate it down. So, this is or this or that we can translate it up. So, this is an affine function, this affine functions need not be linear, but every linear function obviously is affine. Every affine function is a convex function because you can just uh, figure it out when you do not have to really do much work in figuring this out. Now, if you additionally define a set C set of all x such that of course, x is in R n, I do not have to tell you that repeatedly, g i x is less than equal to 0 for all i from 1 to m and h j x is equal to 0 for all j from 1 to k, where this is convex and this is affine, then this set C is a convex set and that is what we essentially want at the end of the day. Now, let me go back to straight to the optimization issue. What I want to show you now is that every local minima of the problem C p that is the convex programming problem C p convex programming. Uh, the, the term why I am calling it a program has a historical basis, but I will tell you that history later on, but let me just go in and do the math that every local minimum is global, 
that is there is no local minimum every local minimum is a global minimum. So, if I take the problem C p and consider a local minimum x bar to be a local minimum. Okay. If I consider x bar to be a local minimum what I am supposed to do? Now, it means that there must exist a delta greater than 0 such that for every x which is in the ball centered at x bar of radius delta and whose points also lie in C that that is this set the intersection of C and B delta x bar. For all such x's f of x is bigger than f of x bar right. Now, this is my convex set and let this my this x bar is my global uh, sorry uh, my local minimum. What I have showed that okay, there is a there must be by definition there must be a very bad drawing delta and the a for any points in this intersection this is the set C for any points in this intersection f x is bigger than f x bar this is the definition of a local minimum. Now, you take any arbitrary point y in this set C take any arbitrary y now join this y with x bar join with x bar. Now, if I am supposed to do so, if, if I am to okay, join spelling does not look very nice, it is j o i n. Um, now, let me construct the line segment. So, any point on the line segment connecting y and x bar can be written as lambda y plus 1 minus lambda x bar, which means when lambda is 1 I have y, when lambda is 0 I have x, x bar. So, that means this is lambda equal to 1 and that is lambda equal to 0. So, when I am moving dropping the value of lambda from 1 to 0, I am actually moving along this line segment. So, as I move along this line segment, I will come to this threshold point whose lambda is say lambda naught which corresponds to uh, z corresponding z naught corresponding to lambda naught y plus 1 minus lambda naught x bar. If I reduce the value of lambda from lambda naught all the points lie in this line. So, what I can say is that there exists a lambda naught element of element of the interval 0 1. such that for all lambda between 0 and lambda naught for them all z lambda z defined by that lambda lambda y plus 1 minus lambda x bar. So, now I am considering only those lambdas which are lying in this interval this must be in B delta x bar intersection c this is uh, clear from the geometry here from the picture here. Now, once I know this what would I have that I have that f of z lambda is bigger than f of x bar. Now, which means f of x bar is less than f of z lambda means f of lambda y plus 1 minus lambda x bar, but now this lambda is still lying between 0 and 1. And so, by definition it is lambda f of y plus 1 minus lambda f of x bar. Now, if you do the manipulations if f x bar cuts out from here and because lambda is some quantity between 0 and 1 which excludes 0 and excludes 1. So, lambda is a positive quantity I can divide both sides by lambda because this f x f x bar would ca cancel off to give a 0 on this side. I would simply have this fact it would imply that f of y is bigger than equal to f x bar. Now, you observe that y was just an arbitrary element, y was just an arbitrarily taken element in C. 
it need not be inside this, it could be anywhere else. So, for any arbitrary y, I have been able to prove that f of y is greater than or equal to f of x bar. So, it is true for all y in C, thus proving that x bar is a local, not just a local minimum, it is a global minimum of the function f over the set C. And thus, it shows that the con for a convex function, every local minimum is global and you must have observed that here we have not bothered about the differentiability of, of the convex function. We, we are not really caring whether this function is differentiable or not and this fact is a very, very important fact and you will see how important it is as we come on and as we proceed along and study more about convex optimization. So, uh, we have just learned about the very, very uh, important fact that for a convex problem every local minimum is global. So, this fact is very fundamental and you will see how it helps us in the rest of the talk, but it is very important as I have already mentioned that this class of problems, convex optimization problems have huge applications. Now, instead of going into specific applications, because that would be talking about domains which are not my domain, rather than basically if I am talking about uh, say a problem in electrical engineering or problem in mechanical engineering, there are a lot of problems which can be modeled as the problem C p. Now, instead of that, let us look into some of the most important forms of convex optimization problems and these form, these are the classes which has played a major role in applications because these are the classes of problems which appear repeatedly in applications. So, one of the most important class of problems is the one which is possibly known to many of the viewers viewing this talk is the class of linear programming problems. In this class of problems, you seek to minimize a linear function. See, a linear function you have only this part, you do not have the translation. Every linear function can be expressed as an inner product, which is a very, very simple fact uh, uh, from linear algebra. And I am just assuming that everybody knows what is the definition of a linear function. In case you do not, if you take any function from Rn to R, this function is said to be linear. If these two properties hold, first is the property of additivity that it f of x plus y is same as f x plus f y and the second property is homogeneity that if I take any real number lambda and scale up this vector, scale up or scale down and this is same as lambda f x where lambda is in R. So, this is uh, the definition of a linear function. Now, so, you minim minimize this subject to linear constraints also in most practical problems there is a requirement that all the x i's are greater than or equal to 0. Now, of course, this is a convex optimization problem because I can pose this as so here I have m inequality constraints and also some other group of inequality constraints, n inequality constraints which I read as minus x i or x whatever x j you want to put. So, the m plus n constraints. So, you can actually put this thing put this a i x minus b i this whole thing into a matrix form and you can write this as here 
here when I am writing less than equal to 0, I am meaning that the component every component of this vector is less than equal to 0 and then I can also similarly write it like this or you can equivalently write this as. So, what is this matrix A? This matrix A is a matrix whose rows are the vectors a 1 transpose dot 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 a m transpose. This is actually the matrix A. Now, what you can do is you can actually add an additional slack variable that is you can add an additional s and you can get a equality. So, the standard prop form of a linear programming problem is to minimize C x subject to this is called the L p in standard form and all linear programming books study this problem. We will have a scope to talk about this problem in detail more from a convex optimization perspective. Of course, this is a subclass of convex optimization. Now, the interesting part of this problem you see all these are nothing, but this is clubbing together of a class of affine functions and this is of course, minus each x i is a convex function because minus x i itself is an affine function linear function rather. So, this is you see there are convex inequalities and affine inequalities. So, this set is a con feasible set is a convex set the, the set C which is in this case set of all x in R n such that A x equal to B and x is greater than equal to 0 component wise then this set is a convex set. Now, this problem is interesting in the fact that this linear function has to be always minimized over a constant set. You cannot minimize it over just the whole of R n. For example, if you take the whole real line R and you look at the constant function f x equal to x, this is a linear function, but it does not have a maximum or has a minimum. So, it is unbounded on the whole real line unless you put say a constraint. Suppose you restrict the variables over this interval, then you know this is the minimum point, then you know this is the maximum point, this is a point where the minimum is achieved, this is a point where the maximum is achieved. So, the linear programming problem is essentially a convex problem which is a constant problem. It, you have to have some restrictions like the set C. This problem linear programming problem was first uh, studied during the World War time and during that time it was air force which had given certain problems to a team led by George Danzig in the US in the Rand corporation and they modeled those problems as linear programming problems the, the type of prob problems that we had seen. So, Danzig was yet not sure what to call these pro problems what name to be given to this problem. So, one day he was walking with the famous uh, economist T C Koopmans and then he said ok you know all these problems have come out they are all problems where you have to minimize linear functions under some linear or affine constraints. And Koopman said you see this is what you are doing this is the program of the air force and you are trying to solve their problems you are solved to be a part of their program. So, why do not you just call them linear programming. So, it became this term became came to in vogue linear programming which had then translated into in general optimization in finite dimension is also known as, known as mathematical programming which lately has is been now called mathematical optimization. So, another class of important class of convex optimization problems is a class of quadratic optimization problem under affine constraints that is minimize Of course, A A is again just before like, like in the last one this A you can easily understand this is an M cross N matrix in you 
Usually when we study linear programming it is taken to be a full rank, but that is really not necessary when you discuss the theory. So, A is again an M cross N matrix and B is obviously in R M which I do not have to tell you. Now, this problem is a quadratic problem you see there is a quadratic form here where this is the matrix defining the quadratic form. This function this part only is a convex function that is if you take just this part then this is convex if q is positive semi definite positive semi definite matrices are true generalizations of non negative real numbers that is if q satisfies this condition then this is convex function. Now, if you take two convex functions f 1 and f 2 and if you add them they remain to be a convex function. So, this is a convex function because this, is a, this part is an affine function and you have added it to a convex function. So, this becomes convex. So, if you want to have a convex programming problem then you have to assume that q is positive semi definite p s d is the short form of a positive semi definite used everywhere in the world. So, this problem is called a quadratic optimization convex quadratic optimization problem under linear constraints. It is a very very important class of problems uh, because uh, for example, in the sequential quadratic programming method this problem is the class of sub problems that is solved and this is repeat this class of problems are repeatedly solved. So, trying to solve these problems is a very very important uh, thing to do. So, the other problem is called quadratic problem under affine constraints or linear constraints. Quadratic convex problem with affine constraints. Now, these problems were all studied in the 60s and early 70s and convex optimization was people were thinking that it was almost going to end it was a it is a time 80s was the time for 80s and 90s was the time for the rise of non convex optimization with people talking about Lipschitz and Lipschitz functions and trying to handle them but they soon realized possibly that um, it's not so easy a game to handle non convexity then in, in came in the horizon a class of optimization problems which completely changed the face of optimization and till date they remain to be a thriving area of research and it has again brought back convex optimization to the central and core of or rather into the heart of optimization theory and current optimization research. So, what I am going to now talk to you is some a class of problems called semi definite programming problems. On the face of it when I write it down it would look as if I have just copied the linear programming problem into a scenario where my decision variables are no longer vectors, but matrices. So, we will start by considering the space S n of all n cross n symmetric matrices. Of course, you know a symmetric matrix is the one whose cross elements a i j is equal to a j i. Now, every if you take the class of all square matrix n cross n square matrix, if you stack up if you take the first column and then stack up the second column below it third column below the second column and so on you stack up all the n columns. So, you will get a, a where row you will get a vector which is having n square components. So, which means every so 
every matrix n cross n matrix corresponds to some element in R n cross n. Now, this class where you have this matching between A i j and A j i is actually isomorphic not to R n cross n, but to a subspace of that which is R n into n plus 1 by 2. I will not take off the fun, I would let you try to figure this out. Now, S n plus is a set of all matrix A in S n. See, this is also finite dimensional space because it is isomorphic to this uh, R n into n plus 1 by 2, this is actually the dimension of S n actually. So, A element of S n such that A is a positive semi definite matrix, is a PSD matrix. So, S n plus this set is the collection of positive semi definite matrices, right. So, if A is positive semi definite, it is often written like this. This is called the Loener ordering. Now, let me go back again to this linear programming part, right. Now, when I am writing x greater than 0, what is the set it is representing? It is the set of all x in R n such that all the corresponding components x size, each of the components is greater than or equal to 0. This set is called R n plus. And you might observe because positive semi definite matrices are actually generalizing non negative real numbers, we have given the symbol S n plus quite in you know quite in harmony with R n plus. Now, once I know this, the I am in a finite dimensional space, you might ask me what is the inner product between two symmetric matrices. So, if I take a symmetric matrix X and another symmetric matrix Y, what is the inner product between two symmetric matrices? This is trace of X transpose Y, but for a symmetric matrix X transpose is equal to X. So, this is equal to trace of X Y. Right. Now, what I would now do, you will see I will write down a problem like this, minimize C x, where C is obviously in S n and then take all the A i's in S n and x is obviously in S n. So, all these A i's are in S n and i is obviously from 1 to m. So, I am just imitating the linear program and x is either I write it like this or in this Loener ordering form just I have written x greater than 0 in the linear case I have written like this. I can write it like this or this whatever same thing. So, this problem is called a semi definite programming problem. Well, ultimately, the decision variable has to be a PSD matrix, semi definite programming problem. You might ask the question oh, what a big deal, we have just changed the space from the space of vectors, we are in a space, space of matrices, it is just a linear programming problem in the space of matrix, but space of uh, semi symmetric matrices, but the answer is no. In general, a semi definite programming problem is not a linear programming problem. Why it is not a linear programming problem is a question that we can only give when we learn something more about convex sets that we will start doing tomorrow. And we will show that this is not a linear programming problem, but a convex programming problem in general. So, thus, this class of problems cannot be handled by the methods of linear programming like simplex method and a, a new set of methods has to be developed for them 
and the semi definite programming problems are now showing great power in solving a class of pro problems called polynomial optimization problems which are actually very difficult NPR non convex optimization problems and they are showing great power in very far in a, in order to solve such problems there these things are showing great power in order to get an approximate solution very fast. The power of these problems are very lately coming up and they are coming up in many applications. There are commercial softwares now to solve this class of problems. So, it is very important for us that in this set of lectures in convex optimization we will spend a little part with semi definite programming problem. So, with this basic introduction about convex optimization about the very basic facts about convex functions uh, minimized over convex set that every local minimum has to be a global and telling you some three important classes of convex optimization problem. First is the linear programming problem, second is the quadratic optimization problem with linear constraints and third is a very, very important modern class of convex optimization problem, the semi definite programming problem. So, if you want to know more about these classes of problems, I would suggest you a book called lectures on modern convex optimization. by Bental and Nemirovsky. Sorry. So, why? It is published by Siam, Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. So, with this very basic introduction to convex optimization, that is what the title of the talk says today, what is convex optimization? I uh, stop here, but let me tell you this is a mathematician's point of view of lecturing. I have not given concrete examples, I would not, I cannot claim to be an expert in each and every uh, different discipline, but if you look into these books, you will, you, this book in particular, you will see there are a lot of important engineering applications in this book, which can be modeled as either linear problem or a quadratic problem or a semi definite programming problem. So, thank you very much and good night.